Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stevens with a continuation of our lecture on the characteristics of contemporary poetry. This will be part two, and I'll do a brief review of uh, what we covered in part one. Uh, before we continue, let me point out the picture that accompanies this lecture. In uh, part one, we had a picture of the great African-American poet Langston Hughes, uh, and uh, so for this part, we have a picture of another American poet um, of the Caucasian persuasion, you might say. Uh, this is the poet Stanley Kunitz, and we will be looking at one or more of his poems later on in the course. Let's get started. In this lecture, we got as far as looking at language. Now remember, we are looking at the characteristics of contemporary poetry in terms of four things, and these are four aspects of poetry that of course we could use to describe poetry from any period, whether contemporary or early in the modern period or ancient lyric poetry. We can look at form, language, subject matter, and context. So don't get the idea that these four things are somehow unique uh, to contemporary poetry, but we are looking at them. No, I don't want to change the color scheme. Thank you, Windows. Um, but we are looking at these things uh, as we see them in uh, contemporary poetry, and also we're, we're trying to understand them by contrasting them with uh, these characteristics as we might see them in poems of other periods, particularly the period that precedes the contemporary period, that is the early modern period. So we're looking at these four uh, aspects of poetry as we see them in the poems, in uh, the collection, which I hope that you are reading, a collection of poems called Characteristics of Contemporary Poetry, a collection that gives uh, two poems uh, representative of each of these categories for a total of uh, eight poems. And uh, again, as we did in part one, we'll be going back and forth between the PowerPoint presentation here and the collection itself. So, as I was saying, in part one, we got as far as looking at form and language. And so, after a very brief review, uh, we will uh, continue uh, by looking at characteristics of poetry in terms of subject matter and context. Let me repeat the warning I gave you the first time that what we're looking at are general trends in contemporary poetry. We're not that what I'm saying about all of these characteristics does not necessarily apply to every contemporary poem. And I should also add that we are not trying to look at all the characteristics. Okay? Because, of course, you could write books about the characteristics of contemporary poetry. And in, in a lecture of an hour or so, uh, we're certainly not going to be able to cover all of the characteristics. But we can give um, a big picture of some of the important things. Or let's call them highlights. Highlights of contemporary poetry. We looked at form. We looked at a poem uh, by Robert Frost from earlier in the 20th century as an example of formal poetry. And we said that uh, contemporary poetry tends to move from the formal toward the informal. Uh, we looked at several aspects of form in poetry, rhyme being one aspect of form, uh, 
moving from rhymed poetry to unrhymed, uh, meter being another aspect of poetry moving from formal metrical structure toward free verse, which does not have a fixed metrical pattern. Um, we may not have paid as much attention as I would have liked to the line break itself. I apologize, folks. I don't know why Windows keeps wanting to do that. Um, the importance of the line break, we uh, looked at stanza structure, how where there's a move from the formal stanza toward the irregular stanza, or no stanza at all. Uh, we looked at the move from conventional syntax toward the irregular, unconventional, or even broken syntax. And you will remember uh, that poem we looked at that was based on phrases uh, more so than upon sentences. We looked at language. We looked at how um, contemporary poetry moves uh, more toward the particular. The particular rather than the general. So this would be contemporary poetry, right? Uh, that we that there's uh, more use of the concrete language versus the abstract and more use of colloquial language versus the formal language. And colloquial would consider um, slang, would include slang, and even, of course, the taboo language, the so-called four-letter words, um, vulgar language, and so on. We saw some examples of that uh, in the poem by Sherman Alexie. So let's continue now with subject matter. And we find uh, in contemporary poetry that there is much more of a tendency than in uh, previous periods of literature to use as subject matter the commonplace. Everyday events, everyday, the things that everyone experiences. Uh, a poet will very often, in writing a poem, pick something extremely ordinary, something very particular to uh, focus that poem on. This would include the use of the found object. And we're, what we're going to uh, look at is an example of a poem that uses uh, found objects or found poetry. Sometimes it's called. Uh, and this simply means that the poem is built on something that the poet finds in usually another text, not necessarily, uh, but it could be another text. It could be something from a brochure. Uh, it could be something from another work of literature. It could be something from a newspaper article. It could be uh, a found text, say, in the classified section of the newspaper and so on. But this is the, the found object poem. What we find, and this is particularly important, is that in contemporary poetry, poets are still concerned with universal ideas, universal truths about human experience, but that these are things are found in the particular, okay? Such as in the everyday events. So everyday events, the things that happen to us on a daily basis, uh, the things that we find in our homes, that we find in our jobs, things that we experience when we go to the supermarket, when we take a walk down the street, when we get on the bus, and so on. These particular things the poet will use to find the universal instead of the poet making some abstract statement about eternal truth in the language of the abstract or the general. Now I'm using as an example of what I mean here something relatively trivial. Contemporary poetry is not greeting card verse. So it doesn't sound like this, and I just made this up for the purposes of this lecture, but this is the kind of thing that you might find in a Hallmark card. You go into CVS or 
a card store and you're looking for cards for a particular occasion, this is the kind of thing that you will often find. True friends are like the April rain that make the flowers grow, and like the sun comes back again to warm the garden so. All right? So what we're doing here is we're taking friendship, right? We're taking friendship and we're making general statements about it. General statement about friendship. And in earlier periods of lyric poetry, subject matter tended to be much more of this kind, less focused on the commonplace and the everyday and the particular and more focused upon the general and the eternal. Now, as I say, this is trivial. I don't mean to imply that in previous periods of literature that poetry tended to be trivial, not at all. Um, but just using this as an example of what I mean by the abstract and the general expression of the eternal. Let's go and look at what I mean by the commonplace, the everyday event. We're going to look at Lucille Clifton's poem about the bus. So we need to go to our characteristics of contemporary poetry. And let's scroll back up to, okay, let's see, subject matter. Okay, where is that? bus poem. Here we go. Here we go. Lucille Clifton, another uh, important American poet, also an African American, uh, who draws very much upon the African American experience in her poetry. Uh, now, so whose side are you on? And Lu Lucille Clifton retorts. All right, now that question, by the way, Notice it. Whose side are you on? It's often a rhetorical question that implies uh, that somebody has chosen the wrong side. Like, you know, are you on our side or are you on their side? And Lucille Clifton turns that around in a kind of rhetorical retort, if you will, or uh, repulse of the question, saying, wait a minute, I'm on the side of the bus stop woman trying to drag her bag up the front steps before the doors clang shut. I am on her side. I give her exact change. And him, the old man hanging by one strap, his work hand folded shut as the bus doors. I am on his side. When he needs to leave, I ring the bell. I am on their side, riding the late bus into some into the same someplace. I am on the dark side always, the side of my daughters, the side of my tired sons. Poem by Lucille Clifton. Whose side are you on? So look at what Lucille Clifton is doing here. Writing about an eternal subject, about a general aspect. Oh, come on. I don't know why you want to do this. Why would I want to change the color scheme to improve performance? I'm quite fine with this. Sorry about that. But she's, as I say, writing about a general aspect of human ex experience that is um, sympathy with one's fellow human being, right? But she's writing about it in terms of something extremely ordinary, and that is a bus ride. And we've all, well, those of us who have ridden buses, say, down the streets of Baltimore, will recognize these images, right? The bus stop woman dragging her bag up the front steps and so on, the old men riding the bus and trying to hang on, they're standing up in the aisle and so on. All of these things are ordinary commonplace 
parts of human experience, right? So we've got the everyday. Every day is a bus ride. Ordinary, right? And by the way, ordinary, one of the meanings of ordinary is every day. Okay? Ordinary people. But of course, what Lucille Clifton finds in this everyday ordinary bus ride with ordinary people in it is something that is extraordinary, and that is the, the human ability to sympathize with one's fellow man or woman. Let's, before we go on here, let's point out something else that Clifton does, and this is not about subject matter, but rather about form. Look at the fact that she does not capitalize in her title, right? You all know the rules for capitalization in titles. You capitalize the uh, first letter of every main word in the in the title, right? And she does not. She chooses to use lowercase. And notice that she does this throughout. Traditionally, uh, the uh, first a uh, letter of the first word of a line of poetry is capitalized. She doesn't capitalize anything. It's all lowercase. Normally that vertical pronoun, the personal pronoun I, of course, would be capitalized, but she doesn't. Lucille Clifton, in her poetry, rejects the conventional use of capitals, including especially that uh, use of the uh, first-person pronoun. Uh, so again, departing uh, from the formal structure of language, in this particular case in the use of capitalization. Secondly, notice that she doesn't use any punctuation. All of this written out uh, in phrases, and she even has sentences, right? I give her exact change. I give her exact change, but uh, there's no punctuation to mark the beginning and end of sentences, is there? So, let's move on to our next example of subject matter. And that's going to be this poem by Billy Collins. Now, this is not so much an example of picking commonplace everyday experience as it is um, the use of a found object, in this case text that is writing from the um, titles of Chinese poetry, ancient Chinese poetry. But the point here is that this is another characteristic of contemporary poetry uh, that's indicated or symbolized, if you will, by the use of the found object, and that is the poet finding his poems in the things that he sees right in front of him, the particular things. So the found poem, and the found poem also is um, a common modern and, and contemporary form of poem. And in this particular case, Billy Collins is finding his poem in the titles of these Chinese poems from the Song Dynasty. So reading an anthology of Chinese poems of the Song Dynasty, I pause to admire the length and clarity of their titles. It seems these poets have nothing up their ample sleeves. They turn over so many cards so early, telling us before the first line whether it is wet or dry, night or day, the season the man is standing in, even how much he has had to drink. Maybe it is autumn, and he is looking at a sparrow, Maybe it is snowing on a town with a beautiful name. 
viewing peonies at the Temple of Good Fortune on a cloudy afternoon is one of Sung Tung Po's dipping water from the river and simmering tea is another one or just on a boat awake at night and Lu Yu takes the simple rice cake with in a boat on a summer evening I heard the cry of a water bird it was very sad and seemed to be saying my woman is cruel moved I wrote this poem there is no iron turnstile to push against here, as with headings like Vortex on a string, The Horn of Neurosis, or whatever. No confusingly inscribed welcome mat to puzzle over. Instead, I walk out on a summer morning to the sound of birds and a waterfall. Is a beaded curtain pushing over my sh brushing over my shoulders and Ten days of spring rain have kept me indoors, is a servant who shows me into the room where a poet with a thin beard is sitting on a mat with a jug of wine, whispering something about clouds and cold wind, about sickness and the loss of friends. How easy he has made it for me to enter here, to sit down in a corner, cross my legs like his, and... Listen. All right, Billy Collins, finding his poem in something as odd and unusual as the titles of other poems. And you get the general idea here, don't you? Of the titles of poems by Chinese poets of the Sung Dynasty are very long. And they're very descriptive. And in the detail and descriptiveness of their titles... Billy Collins finds a certain amount of welcome and comfort. He knows where he is. He's being invited right into the place where the, the poet sits. And so what is he saying? He's saying something, of course, about the nature of poetry. Uh, by contrast, he seems to be suggesting uh, some poets, especially some poems, especially of the modern period, uh, seem to be rather obscure and hard to get into, right? That reference to the iron turnstile. Well, that would be a metaphor for the more obscure titles of poems that you might find. Titles such as Vortex on a String. What the heck does that mean? That certainly isn't as clear as a title that says that we're in a boat on a summer evening and we hear the cry of a water bird and saying, and so on and so forth, right? So, finding the subject matter of a poem in something right in front of you. Notice something else that Collins is doing here about the subject matter. Now, the subject matter, of course, is not just the titles of the Chinese poems. It's also the experience of the speaker here in the poem reading. Again, getting back to that idea of finding poetry in something relatively commonplace. And I do apologize for that pop-up. I don't know what that means and why that's coming up. It's never happened to me before, but we'll get by it, won't we? We'll get through that. Um, just ignore it. As I was saying, um, the ordinary everyday experience of sitting down to read then becomes the, the uh, subject matter of this poem. So, let's have a look at that. Where he focuses on that experience. He says that the titles... And he's looking at uh, these titles in particular, right? He's looking at this title. This title is like a beaded curtain brushing over my sh shoulders. As if he were going into a room that um, has a curtain over the doorway, and he's going into this room and perhaps sitting down with a poet. And then also this one. He's saying, this title is like a servant 
who shows me into the room. How easy he has made it for me to enter here. He's talking about the experience of reading, isn't he? So two things we notice. The poet finds his subject matter or her subject matter, in Lucy O'Clifton's case, finds that subject matter in the ordinary, everyday, commonplace things, um, and also in the ordinary, everyday, commonplace experiences such as the experience of riding the bus or simply reading. Let's go on then to look at context. By context, I mean the cultural location of the poem. Poetry doesn't exist in isolation from the uh, culture that, in a sense, produces that poem. The poet lives, of course, in the present. The poet rides the bus, as we saw. The poet sits down and reads poetry and so on. The poet lives in the present. And so too does the poem. We can say, therefore. Now, I mentioned that the poem will always find something universal and eternal about human experience that goes beyond the present, but the poem also lives in the present. Meaning, meaning the cultural, ethnic, social, often political context. It's going to refer to something beyond itself in the culture in which it exists, the culture of that present that we're talking about. And as a result, much of the poem, and this is particularly true of contemporary poetry, um, much of the poem is outside the poem in that context. Now, all literature exists in the context that produces it. That is, the context of the world, uh, the society that the poet lives in. Right? So, the context of the present, the present day, its institutions, and so on. But what I'm getting at here is that in contemporary poetry there is much more reference to that context. And this tends to make sorry about that. This tends to make the poem highly elusive, meaning that it alludes or refers to much that is outside of the poem. And this also accounts for much of contemporary poetry's difficulty. And you'll see what I mean with a few relatively obvious examples. Again, this is not all the time. There will be some poems that seem to be much more self-contained in uh, contemporary poetry. Uh, but very often, a poem will depend upon its social, ethnic, cultural or political context, or all four of those. Uh, and you'll see what I mean when we go to, let's see, uh, let's begin with that poem by Sherman Alexie. And go to Characteristics of Contemporary Poetry. Let's go down. Uh, we'll get back to that poem by Kuanyaka called Facing It. We're going to begin with the powwow at the end of the world. And we'll, I'll begin right away by pointing out the ethnic context here, just in case you were wondering what I meant by that. 
Mr. Alexi is Native American. That's the ethnic context, or racial, if you will. Pow wow might suggest that because you might associate that word pow wow that is a uh, what we might call a conference or a gathering uh, of people for some kind of formal purpose of discussion. We might associate that uh, with uh, Native American culture. The context is also political, meaning the politics of uh, negotiating between different ethnic groups. The Native American, of course, being uh, an oppressed, we would say, a lot of people would say, oppressed minority in a majority white culture. So you have the politics of being a Native American in a white-dominated culture and so on. Uh, we have Native American culture, all right? Culture in which there is a particular meaning for things like the end of the world and the powwow at the end of the world uh, and also certain myths and legends such as the myth of the salmon that tells stories at that powwow at the end of the world. So that's what I mean by the ethnic and political and cultural uh, context of the poem and we need to understand this in order to fully appreciate what Alexi is doing here. So, let's have a look at the poem and I'll go into this further, what I mean. I am told by many of you that I must forgive and so I shall. After an Indian woman puts her shoulder to the Grand Coulee Dam and topples it. I am told by many of you that I must forgive and so I shall after the flood waters burst each successive dam downriver from the Grand Coulee. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall, after the floodwaters find their way to the mouth of the Columbia River as it enters the Pacific and causes all of it to rise. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall, after the first drop of flood water is swallowed by that salmon waiting in the Pacific. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall, after that salmon swims upstream through the mouth of the Columbia and then past the flooded cities, broken dams and abandoned reactors of Hanford. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall, after that salmon swims through the mouth of the Spokane River as it meets the Columbia, then upstream until it arrives in the shallows of a secret bay on the reservation where I wait alone. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall, after that salmon leaps into the night air above the water, throws a lightning bolt at the brush near my feet, and starts the fire which will lead all of the lost Indians home. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall, after we Indians have gathered around the fire with that salmon, who has three stories it must tell before sunrise. One story will teach us how to pray. Another story will make us laugh for hours. The third story will give us reason to dance. I am told by many of you that I must forgive, and so I shall when I am dancing with my tribe during the powwow at the end of the world. There is a great deal of illusion in this poem. Um, but I suppose the question becomes, well, how much of this illusion do we need? And I think we need it in, f in order to fully appreciate um, what Alexei's getting at here. Well, first of all, there is that illusion to the 
political context. I am told by many of you that I must forgive. Forgive who for what? Right? Forgive the white man. For crimes against the Indian, right? So we imagine we imagine white culture telling the Native Americans on their reservations and in our cities and so on, well, yes, we admit that we stole your land, we admit that we massacred your people by the thousands, but you need to forgive us. So that's the general context, isn't it? Sherman Alexi referring to that uh, hostility, if you will, that animosity between the Native Americans and the white Americans over the way that the Indians have been treated, uh, especially during the so-called Indian Wars of the late 19th century, when the uh, U.S. Army moved in and really did wipe out Indian tribes in the attempt to control the land that was being occupied by the Native Americans. So that gives us, right? That gives us our context, the big context. Then we have details of that context. And here are the details. The Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia River which, of course, flooded much of the land, created great reservoirs, and was used to generate hydroelectricity for the growing cities of Oregon and Washington states. That's what he's referring to here. Uh, the Grand Coulee Dam, which, of course, made the land habitable for the purposes of white culture, but in many ways destroyed Native American culture. And in particular, the illusion is in the way that white culture changed the landscape. Changed the landscape, and so what Alexei's argument is here essentially, yes, I, we, I, and by extension, we Native Americans will forgive you white people when things have been reversed, when all of the things that you have done to our landscape, such as building these dams, uh, everything you have done has been reversed, and we go back to the way things were when we occupied the lambs, land on our own terms, right? The salmon, very important. Now, salmon, as you may know, uh, return to the fresh waters where they were born. They return to those fresh waters in order to spawn, that is, in order to lay their own eggs, have their own babies, as it were. And so what he's describing here is the salmon being able to swim up this river again the way the salmon used to before the dams were put in. Now, of course, salmon still swim up past those dams. Uh, there are fish gates that uh, have been built so that salmon can do this. But again, that's different. Alexei is imagining uh, the river the way it was when the salmon didn't have to go up these special contraptions around the dams, but could simply swim up the river to the so-called spawning grounds. And then, of course, he's imagining this powwow at the end of the world where all the tribes gather as one to celebrate uh, the, the end of time, if you will, uh, the coming of the uh, eternal age, and so on. He's imagining this powwow where the world as we know it has ended and the world as um, the great spirit has meant it to be has arrived. Well, that's going to happen, Alexei is saying, 
only after we have managed to get past everything that you white folks have done. Context. In order to appreciate this poem, then, in order to appreciate the passion um, and, to a certain extent, the anger and so on, the conflict behind it, we have to understand that context. Let's look at another example of what I mean by social uh, and political and ethnic context, and that is this fine poem by Komunyaka, Yusef Komunyaka, called Facing It. And remember again what the general point is here, that another characteristic of contemporary poetry is that it very often relies upon uh, this allusion to important aspects of the context outside the poem, that is, the context in which the poem finds itself, those aspects of cultural, social, political, ethnic life, and so on, that create that context. Komanyaka, African-American poet, Vietnam vet, begins, and you wouldn't necessarily pick up the context at first, would you? Um, but he clues us in the same way that uh, Sherman Alexie clues us in with words like powwow and the reference to the Indian woman putting her shoulder against the dam. Uh, Kumanyaka gives us clues to the uh, ethnic and, culture and uh, cultural and political context. He writes, My black face fades hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't. Damn it. No tears. I'm stone. I'm flesh. My clouded reflection eyes me like a bird of prey, the profile of night slanted against morning. I turn this way. The stone lets me go. I turn that way. I'm inside the Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. I go down the 58,022 names half expecting to find my own letters, like smoke. I touch the name Andrew Johnson. I see the booby trap's white flash. Names shimmer on a woman's blouse. But when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. Brush strokes flash, a red bird's wings cutting across my stare. The sky, a plane in the sky. A white vet's image floats closer to me. Then his pale eyes look through mine. I'm a window. He's lost his right arm. Inside the stone, in the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair. This, uh, folks, is a very moving a poem. It's also a very complicated poem, and it's not one that I can do justice to here in the final minutes of this lecture. But let's simply look at the main point, and that has to do with context. First of all, the context of race. Right? My black face and the black granite. And then, of course, contrasting with um, the image of the white veteran who's the, here uh, at this particular location. Second thing about the context, of course, is that location. He is at, he finally tells us, several lines into the poem, at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And this, of course, is the memorial in Washington, D.C., on the mall. Uh, if you haven't seen it, um, you should. Get yourself down to D.C. the next time you're down there. Um, go to the mall and visit the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It's extremely moving. So we have that context. We say, okay, okay, that's part of the context here is Vietnam. And then, of course, those names are the names of the men who were lost in Vietnam during that conflict um, and other references to the war, the booby trap 
part of that context, the booby traps white flash, he is thinking back to one of the ways in which men lost their lives in that conflict. They would walk into a booby trap. There would be explosives there in that booby trap that we either kill them or maim them in some way. And that also brings in the plane in the sky. Now, of course, this would literally be a plane that goes over Washington, D.C., as Komunyaka is there uh, visiting the memorial, but it would also, of course, be a reference to the aircraft flying over Vietnam during a battle such as the helicopters with their, their guns and with their bombs and their napalm and so on. And then, of course, I mentioned the white vet and his image closer to me. Look at what he does here. He has lost his right arm. He has lost his right arm. By this point in the poem, if we are picking up on that context of the Vietnam War, we would think, oh, um, you know, he's an amputee. He lost this war. Uh, he lost this arm during the war, and now he is without his right arm uh, until we get back to inside the stone and we realize, okay, the arm has disappeared into the mirror of this polished granite. He hasn't literally lost his arm. Um, but in, his, in the reflection of this soldier, in the mirror of the granite, uh, Komunyaka can't see that arm because it's disappeared into the reflection there. And, of course, the black mirror is the stone itself. There is so much more and that we could say about this poem. And, folks, I am not trying to give you an interpretation of it. All... I'm trying to do at this point is point out that in order to fully grasp this poem, in order to do whatever interpretation we might do, we have to pick up on the context. The poem depends upon the context of the ethnic, that is a black man uh, in this war, uh, and then also the context of the war itself and all of that all that the war meant to American culture and still means to American culture. It's time to uh, end this lecture. I've gone well past my uh, self-imposed allotted time of 30 minutes. So we will have to continue by looking more closely at what the poems mean. But just remember uh, that we're looking at these general characteristics language, form, uh, subject matter, and the importance of context. Let's go back uh, as we wrap things up to our PowerPoint presentation. Finally, contemporary poetry is often composed of fragments, that is, bits and pieces, images, that the poet deliberately has not put together into a coherent statement. And this is one of the things that is happening in Facing It. I would say that all eight poems uh, in that collection, for me, Facing It would be the most difficult for this reason, that it is um, a collection of bits and pieces. They all relate, of course, to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and to the war, um, but the, the poet hasn't made a single coherent statement about that experience of war, of being an African American who fought in the war and so on. Um, and there are reasons for this. It's one of the reasons that contemporary poetry is very often difficult. Um, it puts a lot of responsibility upon the phenomenon of fragmentation. Come on. Well, for some reason, can't get my pen to come up. There we go.
Dama the Frag. Come on, folks. Give me a break and cooperate. Fragmentation is another characteristic of much of contemporary poetry that we see in Komenyaka's poem. And so we'll have to have a look at that uh, as we go along. Uh, but facing it is an example of this particular phenomenon. So that's all for now. Thanks for listening, and I will see you online.